A Lecture on the Various Rituals of Freemasonry from the 10th Century by Rev. G. Oliver, D.D. Pass D.P.G.M. Brought to you by Masonic Audiobook Library. Freemasonry is a moral order, instituted by virtuous men, with the praiseworthy design of recalling to our remembrance the most sublime truths, in the midst of the most innocent and social pleasures, founded on liberality, brotherly love, and charity. Brethren, it is rather late in life for me to appear before a lodge of intelligent masons in the capacity of a lecturer, and it is only the respect I entertain for masonry that could induce me to do so. And even under the influence of that feeling, I should scarcely have ventured to solicit your attendance this evening, if I had not been under an impression that I could tell you something which is not generally known to the fraternity. Indeed, I am satisfied, from the general tenor of my Masonic correspondence, that there are many brethren in England who would travel over half the island, and think themselves well paid for their trouble, to acquire the information I am now about to communicate to you, not only on the ancient rituals, but on various signs, tokens, and observances used by the fraternity many years ago, and now entirely forgotten. During the last century, several revisions of the ritual took place, each being an improvement on its predecessor, and all based on the primitive Masonic lecture which was drawn up in the tenth century and attached to the York Constitutions. This lecture, to which I shall first call your attention, was in doggerel rhyme, a kind of composition which was very popular amongst our Saxon ancestors in the time of Athelstane. About the latter end of the fourteenth century, it was carefully translated from the Saxon for the use of the York Grand Lodge, and the MS of that date is now in the British Museum. This invaluable document contains copious rules and regulations for the observance of the craft, and is so curious that I shall give you a specimen of it to show the unchangeable character of the order. It thus describes the duty of the master. The first article of good masonry shows that the master must surely be both steadfast, trusty, and also true, his place he never then shall rue. He must, neither for love nor dread, of neither party to take meed, whether he lord or fellow be, of him to take no kind of fee, but as a judge to stand upright, and then his conduct will be bright. It speaks thus of an E. A. P. The master shall not for any vantage make an apprentice under age, and, as you may plainly hear, he must have his limbs both whole and fair, for to the craft it were great shame, to make a half-man and a lame for a man of tainted blood would do the craft but little good. This was a primitive observance amongst the craft, for in the constitutions of Athelstane, the E.A.P. was solemnly enjoined, his master's counsel to keep close, lest he his confidence should lose, the secrets of brethren tell to none, nor out of the lodge what there is done. Whatever you hear the master say, be sure thou never do betray, lest it cause in thee much blame, and bring the craft to public shame. Here. Also, we find the origin of a clause in our present Master Mason's obligation. It charges thee, upon thy life, not to corrupt thy master's wife, nor thy fellow's concubine, as thou wouldst not have him do by thine full mickle care might thus begin. From such a foul and deadly sin, the obligation was thus constructed. The fourteenth point is full good law, to him that would be under awe. A solemn oath he needs must swear, to his master and fellows. Hat be there, to be both steadfast and true also, to all these laws wherever he go, and to his liege lord the king, to be true above all other things. Thus did our ancient brethren lecture eight hundred years ago, establishing a series of landmarks which are not yet overthrown. In the reign of Edward III, A.D. 1357, the decrees of the order ran in the following form. That for the future, at the making or admission of a brother, the ancient constitutions and charges shall be read. That when the master and wardens preside in a lodge, the sheriff, if need be, or the mayor, or the alderman, if a brother, where the chapter is held, shall be sociate to the master. That the fellow crafts shall travel honestly for their pay and love their fellows as themselves. And that all shall be true to the king, to the realm, and to the lodge. That if any of the fraternity should be fractious, mutinous, or disobedient to the master's orders, and, after proper admonition, should persist in his rebellion, he shall forfeit all claims to the rights, benefits, and privileges of a true and faithful brother. These charges conclude with the words, 
so mote it be. The first catechismal formula was introduced by Grand Master Sir Christopher Wren, about the year 1685, and was called an examination. It was very concise, and might be gone through in ten minutes or a quarter of an hour. The obligation was short and simple, and had no penalty, for that which is now used as a penalty formed a portion of the examination. As thus, which is the point of your entry? I hear and conceal under the penalty of having my throat cut, or my tongue pulled out of my head. I am inclined to think that Freemasonry at this time had only one degree. You would probably like to hear a few passages from Sir Christopher's ritual. It commenced thus. Q. Peace be to all here. A. I hope there will. Q. What o'clock is it? A. It's going to six, or going to twelve. Q. Are you very busy? A. No. Q. Will you give or take? A. Both. Or which you please. Q. How go squares? A. Straight. Q. Are you rich or poor? A. Neither. Q. Change me that? The sign. A. I will. Q. What is a mason? A. A man begot by a man, born of a woman, brother to a king, fellow to a prince. Q. In the name of the king and holy church, are you a mason? A. I am so received and accepted. Q. Where were you made a mason? A. In a just and perfect lodge. Q. How many make a lodge? A. God and the square, with five or seven right and perfect masons, on the highest mountains or the lowest valleys in the world. Q. Where is the master's point? A. At the east window, waiting the rising of the sun to set his men to work. Q. How is the meridian found out? Q. When the sun leaves the south, and breaks in at the west end of the lodge. This will be sufficient to show you in what manner the brethren worked 180 years ago. The craft at that time had a series of signs to make themselves known to each other as masons, which are now obsolete. And I introduce them here as a matter of curiosity. When meeting in the street, they saluted each other by raising their hat with the thumb and two fingers only. Sometimes they would strike the inside of the little finger of the left hand three times with the forefinger of the right, or rub their right eye three times with two fingers, or they would take up a stone and ask what it smells of, the correct answer to which was, neither of brass, iron, or any other metal, but of a mason. Q. What is your name? A. E. A. P. Lewis or Caution? A. F. C. Geometry or Square? A. M. M. Cassia or Gabon? Q. How old are you? A. E. A. P. Under seven years. A. M. M. Above seven years. When in a mixed company, the token was, to turn down their glass after drinking. And if anyone saw a brother misconduct himself, he exhibited his disgust by placing his open right hand on his upper lip, which served as a check to further indiscretion. The operative fraternity in these ages had certain private signals, which must have been very convenient. For instance, if a master wanted one of his workmen from the top of a steeple, he would catch his eye and then touch the calf of his right leg, if from any other part of the church, the left ankle, if from any secular edifice, he put his right hand behind his back. If he wanted a man at the house of rendezvous, he put his left hand behind. There were many others of a similar nature, which are now obsolete. As masonry increased in popularity, under the patronage of noble and influential grand masters during the 18th century, many improvements were made on the primitive ritual at different periods. The Reformation was commenced by brothers Desigoulier and Anderson, about the year 1720, and their ritual mentions for the first time, a master's part. There was no master's part before 1720, and here also the obligation is accompanied by the penalty, but not a syllable is mentioned about a substituted word. On the contrary, it asserts that the lost word was actually found. I shall give you specimens of this formula in each of the three degrees, merely premising, that in those days the office of deacon was unknown. Entered Apprentices, Degree Q. Where stands the senior EAP? A. In the South. Q. What is his business? A. To hear and receive instructions, and welcome strange brothers. Q. Where stands the junior EAP? A. In the North. Q. What is his business? A. To keep out all Cowans and eavesdroppers. Q. If a Cowan or a listener is catched, how is he to be punished? A. 
to be placed under the eaves of the house in rainy weather, till the water runs in at his shoulders and out at his heels. Q. What do you learn by being an operative mason? A. To hew, square, mold stone, lay a level, and raise a perpendicular Q. What do you learn by being a gentleman mason? A. Secrecy, morality, and good fellowship. Q. Have you seen a master today? A. I have. Q. How was he clothed? A. In a yellow jacket and blue pair of breeches. Fellow craft's degree. Q. How high was the door of the middle chamber? A. So high that a cowan could not reach to stick a pin into it. Q. When you came to the middle chamber, what did you see? A. The resemblance of the letter G. Q. What did that G denote? A. One that's greater than you. Q. Who is greater than I, that am a free and accepted mason and master of a lodge? A. The grand architect and builder of the universe, or he that was taken up to the top of the pinnacle of the holy temple. Master Mason's degree Q. From whence came you? A. From the east. Q. Where are you going? A. To the west. Q. What are you going to do there? A. To seek for that which was lost and is now found. Q. What is that which was lost and is now found? A. The Master Mason's word. Q. What is the name of a Master Mason? A. Cassia is my name. From a just and perfect lodge I came. A Master Mason raised most rare, from the diamond ashlar to the square. The next reviser of the ritual was Martin Clare, a deputy, grand, master. And he executed his task so much to the satisfaction of the grand lodge that his lectures were ordered to be used by all the brethren within the limits of its jurisdiction. In accordance with this command, we find the officers of the Grand Lodge setting an example in the provinces, and in an old minute book of a lodge in Lincoln, dated 1734, of which Sir Cecil Ray, the deputy provincial, master, was the master, there are a series of entries through successive lodge nights to the following effect, that two or more sections, as the case might be, of Martin Clare's lectures were read when the master gave an elegant charge, went through an examination, and the lodge was closed with songs and decent merriment. The following extract from these lectures may be acceptable. Q. What is the covering of a Masonic lodge? A. A celestial canopy of divers' colors. Q. How do we hope to arrive at it? A. By the help of a ladder. Q. What is it called in scripture? A. Jacob's ladder. Q. How many rounds or staves in that ladder? A. Rounds or staves innumerable, each indicating a moral virtue, but three principal ones called faith, hope, and charity Q. Describe them. A. Faith in Christ, hope, in salvation, and to live in charity with all mankind. Q. Where does that ladder reach to? A. To the heavens. Q. What does it rest upon? A. The holy book. Thirty years after the great schism which split the society into two divisions, conventionally distinguished as ancient and modern viz., in 1770 bro. Dunkerley was commissioned by the Grand Lodge to compile an improved ritual in all the three degrees, which he accomplished to the universal satisfaction of the fraternity. For bro Dunkerley was a very distinguished mason. In his version, the three principal steps of the Masonic ladder were referred to the Christian doctrine of the three states of the soul. First, in its tabernacle the body, as an illustration of faith, then, after death, in paradise, as the fruits of hope, and lastly, when reunited to the body in glory about the throne of God, as the sacred seat of universal charity. The original hint at a circle and parallel lines, as important symbols of the order, has been ascribed to him. Here, the doctrine of a substituted word was formally announced, for the true word had been transferred to the royal arch which he introduced into the Grand Lodge as a legitimate degree of masonry. As a specimen of his lecture, take the following extract. Q. How do masons know each other in the day? A. By seeing a brother and observing the sign. Q. How in the night? A. By feeling the token and hearing the word. Q. How blows a mason's wind? A. Favorably, due east and west. Q. For what purpose? A. To cool and refresh the men go, at and from their labor. Q. What does it further allude to? A. 
to those miraculous winds which first blew east and then west, and proved so essential in working the happy deliverance of the children of Israel from their Egyptian bondage, and also the overthrow of Pharaoh and his host in their attempt to follow. Q. What time is it? A. High time. Q. Bro J W. What is to be done at high time? A. To call the men from labor to refreshment, to see that they keep within hail and come on again in due time, that the master may have pleasure and profit thereby. I pass over the lectures of Calcott and Hutchinson, because they were not adapted to lodge practice. The exemplifications of York Masonry were completed by the celebrated Bro Preston, who constructed a ritual which contains a satisfactory survey of the system, as it was undoubtedly used by the York Lodges in 1777, when the Lodge of Antiquity, of which Bro Preston was a past master, seceded from the London Grand Lodge, and avowed an alliance with the Grand Lodge at York.